Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, assalamu alaikum. Welcome, uh, everyone, to uh, another The Bad Lab Policy Roundtable. Uh, today's our 60th roundtable. It's been such a privilege to be able to talk to experts from around the world on things that matter uh, to a lot of people, to a lot of countries, and particularly to the South Asia, Central Asia, and Middle Eastern region. Uh, today, the conversation is a lot more focused on Pakistan. Uh, this is a hard conversation to have at even the best of times. It's a particularly difficult conversation to have whilst the rest of the world is uh, sliding into uh, unprecedented uh, natures and levels of crises. Uh, regardless, Pakistan needs to continue to be a salient and solvent entity as a, as a country. And one of the challenges to this uh, solvency is the fiscal equation in Pakistan for decades, uh, certainly throughout uh, my career, uh, the question of Pakistan being fiscally uh, imbalanced, of having a fiscal regime that is unsustainable, those questions have, uh, for the last quarter century, uh, they have uh, plagued policymakers, uh, they've plagued people who study and examine uh, public policy, and they've plagued people that are concerned about the future of the country. Uh, we thought it was it was an opportune time uh, for this conversation, uh, given uh, a whole slew of really important conversations that uh, many Pakistanis are having. And so we're really honored and delighted to have a very capable group of uh, experts talk to us today. Uh, I think without me going into long introductions, uh, we're joined by Shabazz Rana, who is the uh, chief uh, economics and uh, finance correspondent for uh, the Express Tribune. Uh, he also hosts a television show on Express News, uh, along with Gamran Yusuf. Uh, Shabazz's intrepid reporting uh, both provokes and uh, prompts to think more deeply about the key challenges uh, that the country faces in terms of public policy around finance and economics. So thank you, Shabazz, for joining us. Uh, we're joined by uh, Sobia Khurram. Uh, she's a academic and a researcher. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had the chance to listen to her speak uh, most recently at uh, a conference that was hosted by PIDE and the World Bank. Uh, and, and we're privileged to have you uh, join us, uh, Madam uh, Sobia. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome, of course, my colleague, Samia Liakat Ali Khan. Samia is the head for policy impact and leads our Center for uh, Public Health and Gender. Uh, thank you, Samia, for taking time today. I know, uh, you know, there's a lot going on uh, at your desk, but I think there's a really important conversation. We're also joined by Tobias uh, Akhtar Haq. Tobias is the lead country economist for the World Bank in Pakistan. Um, not an easy job at the best of times and a complex job for sure uh, in, in recent uh, months and particularly recent weeks or recent days. So thank you for uh, joining the conversation. Uh, Tobias. And then, of course, uh, we're also joined by uh, my very good friend, um, Sajid Amin. Uh, Dr. Sajid Amin is a deputy exec executive director at uh, the Sustainable Development Policy Institute. And uh, just last week hosted a really crucial and important conversation around these same issues. So I'm so happy that uh, Sajid has joined us. Uh, Sajid is also conducting, I think, some of the most exciting research on Pakistan's fiscal issues. And a lot of us have been waiting for several weeks to look at, uh, to, to, to get a look uh, at that research, but I think we'll be benefiting from some of those insights, hopefully during this conversation. So thank you, uh, Sajid, for, for doing this. Um, I wanted to, start with you, Shabazz, and very quickly just dive into this question. You've done some great reporting um, in, in, in recent, I mean, you've always done great reporting, um, oftentimes reporting that I've disagreed with, or that's sort of, you know, rubbed me the wrong way as well. And I'm always so happy that you're able to sort of engage with people that have questions about that. I really enjoyed uh, your story this weekend, uh, which I don't think really was about the World Bank. I think that story was about Pakistan's fiscal culture. And I think that story is a perfect setup for this conversation. And the story, I'll let you describe it in greater detail, 
But basically, the story is that this country doesn't tax enough people. Uh, and, and my view is doesn't tax the people that are most meriting of being taxed. Uh, and because it doesn't tax enough people, it doesn't have enough money to run its affairs. And because it doesn't have its, enough money to run its affairs, it, ha it runs into all kinds of challenges. Uh, those challenges are all across the spectrum of public life in Pakistan. But the root cause is not just an absence of enough taxes. It's that the wrong people are being taxed. Maybe walk us through some of the numbers that, that you revealed through your story, because not everybody would have read your story. As you know, Shabazz, people are interested in 20, 30 second clips. So give us multiple clips that we can uh, we can work with here in terms of this taxation problem. And you'll have to unmute uh, before you begin speaking, Shabazz, because you're muted right now. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. Well, uh, being a journalist, I report on all of you, but this is quite uh, different from, from my core responsibility that I'm speaking as a speaker. And thank you, Mr. for that. I don't have much information to add, uh, except sharing few numbers, I think. And those numbers are very critical because all of you are in, in some way affect the policy making and you, you people enjoy great influence on policy makers. Two, two to three questions that I'll, I'll leave for you people. But before that, uh, the story everyone knows it was about a World Bank recommendation um, about uh, lowering the income tax exemption threshold, meaning thereby, uh, what 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 is the income level that should be taxed? Which at this point in time is over rupees fifty thousand per month. Uh, World Bank has clarified that that it didn't mean that uh, it was an it was a recommendation that was based on an old data. So thing, things are settled in that manner. Uh, but there are a few numbers, and those numbers are quite disturbing. The number is. That in the previous fiscal year, uh, Pakistan's salaried class paid rupees 264 billion in taxes, which was equal to 12.1 percent of the total income tax paid by Pakistanis. Number one. Number two. The second number is that Pakistan's richest textile exporters, they who exported about 28 billion dollars worth of goods in the previous fiscal year, and they paid just 74 billion rupees in taxes. And same is the situation with, with Pakistan's another richest class, maybe not richest, but the richer ones. Uh, the, re the retailers, they paid hardly 15 billion rupees in taxes in the previous fiscal year. And the situation has not changed. Uh, during the, my weekend story, I also reported number based on the data of the first quarter, which means from July to September this fiscal year. The salad class, again, paid rupees 71 billion in taxes. Yes, mind it that uh, our previous government increased the tax burden of the salad class. Everyone who earns more than rupees 200,000 a month, their tax burden was increased. One, and secondly, the highest uh, tax rate of 35%, which was earlier um, being charged from the people who had monthly income of rupees 1 million, that was half to rupees 500,000. And, and, and these numbers reflect a significant increase in tax contribution uh, by, the, by the poor, um, salary class, I would call it poor, because compared to other people who don't pay their taxes, 33% um, increase in just three months. Now come to the uh, richest exporters who in the first three months exported to, uh, seven billion dollars of goods equal to rupees two trillion and their contribution was 21 billion and their uh, which was just 3.6 percent of the total tax contribution income tax contribution it was in the previous fiscal year four percent so the contribution of the salad class is increasing and the richest people contribution is increasing now i'm throwing you some more numbers and sorry for boring you you people with the numbers there is a report by a Reform and Revenue Mobilization Commission. It's an interim report. It has not been officially released. And the numbers are mind-boggling. The numbers are only less than 14,000 people of uh, filers, only less, less than 14,000 people paid 75% of Pakistan's total income tax in the tax year 2022. If you increase this number to 80, 28,000, 80% 80, 80 of the contribution came from just 28,000 people. And if you increase this number to about 126,000, uh, 90% tax paid by these 127,000 people in tax year 2022. And what is the ratio for India? In India, 22%, more than one-fifth, they, uh, they paid 90% of the total income tax in India. So this gives you a clear reflection of the priorities of the government, 
of the international financial institutions they have been financing tax reforms in pakistan tax reforms has remained an important pillar of every imf program that we have signed uh, at least since 1980s and why this is happening that's a key question just because there are people who are very influential in the system they don't want to pay their tax and along with these number if you just have a look what was said by uh, a uk economist to whom i recently interviewed and that was published that five or six classes are ruling pakistan they they have hijacked the economy political class civil society influential people in the civil society military class and business class and according to him media act as a mouthpiece of all these classes now these numbers show that pakistan's taxation priorities are not right we are not able to collect due taxes from the, from the people who are earning maximum income uh, just because either they have a very strong voice in the system they can manipulate the system they can manipulate anything or uh, which is more important these people are not yet ready to surrender their so called entitlements the chief justice of this country maybe i'm not sure but let's put this way the judiciary the armed forces they are not paying their due taxes so why everything is being paid by this by, by the salaried class why everything is paid by other people i have a long list of the withholding taxes uh, to bias can can shed more light because withholding taxes reforms is part of the of the reforms that the world bank has been pushing under under a policy loan the number one tax collection with holding tax it's profit on debt if you if you deposit your money in a saving account in a bank and you get your profit because this is automatically de- detected and since there was increase in the interest rates so the number one contributor in in terms of withholding taxes in during the first 3 months of this financial year was the profit on debt how much it's about 113 billion rupees the second payment, this is more important Shabazz, I'm just thinking yeah. that this is a fantastic starting point, and and I think you've set us off to the races with this introduction. I, I want you to hold on to more of that data. I'll come back to you, but I just want to bring in Sobia and others into the conversation, and then and then let me come back to you if if that's okay. Shabazz, sure, yeah, yeah, One, wonderful. So Sobia, you you've heard uh, these uh, these statistics, and I think the way that Shabazz has framed them. is largely reflective for better or for worse is largely reflective of the public discourse around some of these issues as well um is there a degree of uh, sort of i mean does this narrative resonate with you or are we missing uh, other elements of the conversation is it just that pakistan salaried class is being exploited i mean one thing shabaz didn't mention was the uh banking uh transactions and the way in which this country basically punishes you if you have a bank account punishes you if you put money in the bank punishes you if you withdraw money out of a bank now i think it's maybe a little too easy to blame this on tobias as well right or on the world bank or the imf but a lot of these decisions are the autonomous sovereign decision making uh swabdeed you know it's the power of the pa- pakistani political Uh, and other uh, powerful forces that decide on these things but but i wanted to get your take on what to what extent this is just a middle class and 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 uh, the exploitation of the poor the exploitation of the middle class or whether there's more uh, sort of factors at play here that that we might be missing sobia yeah um thank you musharraf and thank you tabadla for having me um i was just listening to all these figures i i don't think so um that the salaried people are the only ones who are paying um, taxes there are so many other factors um i would start by i mean i read the world bank report even before the session today um they've recommended multiple reforms they've not just suggested one thing they've suggested multiple things they've suggested um you know close the corporate tax exemptions um increase the excise duties they've recommended reduce tax expenditures in the energy sector they've um also um you know hinted at improving you know taxation on agriculture land um you know the property so 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 these are multiple sets of recommendations and obviously they've you know they've done you know their comprehensive analysis and come up with that um and yes they have recommended reforming the personal income tax i think if you know looking at the public sentiment at the moment and you know you know all the political discourse which is happening around us i think we have to 
assess and prioritize these reforms as our own context, um, maybe we can, you know, have this inequality lens at the moment. Um, we can reform personal income tax, um, not going after the, you know, the people who already have minimum salaries. We don't have to, you know, further reduce the nominal tax rate. We don't have to further reduce it from 50,000. Um, there is a huge gap between the salaried people, the taxes which are paid by them, and the taxes which are not paid by the non-salaried people. So we can reform that, right? And then say, for example, um, you know, th there was a lot of criticism that, you know, um, why can we only improve the, the taxes on agriculture by going after the small farmers? No. Um, we can go after, you know, we can think about, uh, you know, thinking of ways where property tycoons, you know, pay their taxes, where the, the, the bigger agriculturalists who are also the politicians, they pay their share. Um, and, and, and yes, they are, they, you know, these are not practical reforms. And that is why we've not done them for the last four decades. We go for small practical options which are feasible. And we keep ignoring these difficult reforms, and that is why we are here. I think we call, also call them medium term to longer term reforms because we can't do them, and we go for the shorter terms and the ones, you know, the ones who are already taxed. We can tax them more. I think we've reached a point that you know where we have to go for these difficult decisions. Any government, you know, the current government, the future government. Um, I was just thinking of an analogy, you know, the, our current system, the fiscal system is leaking at multiple places. Now, some of those leakages are small. Some of those leakages are large. Um, what we've been doing is that we've been, you know, just plugging those small holes. No, we can't do that anymore. We have to look for the bigger causes, the bigger symptoms, the bigger problems. We also have to differentiate between what is the symptom and what is the problem and probably target the problem. I was just looking at some of the numbers. Our current text to GDP ratio uh, in the bulk bank report was 10.4 percent if we reform the you know the 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 taxes on land and property there is a potential of around two percent of gdp if we improve taxes on agriculture it's around one percent of gdp now if we reform personal income tax by fixing the brackets or re further reducing it's 0.1 percent of the gdp so why do we have to go for 0.1 percent and not the two percent or the one percent because there's you know, there's there's more scope uh, um, over there. And then I, I can also talk about fixing the expenditures. But I think my comment, if you want me to go, you know, uh, keep going, I can do that. Or maybe I can just stop for somebody else to, you know, uh, come up with their well, comment. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think one of the sort of challenges and I, I want to come back to you on this. I don't want you to respond to this right now. But but when I come back to you. It's interesting you say that you can talk also about the expenditure. Uh, my, I have a bias in this conversation. To me, it seems like uh, it's extremely convenient to start talking about expenditure cutting uh, by the elite of a country that don't pay their taxes, right? I know that you're not shilling for the elite necessarily uh, or in, a, in any way at all. But I think one of the kind of reactions that I have to the conversation about expenditure is not that we don't have extra expenditure. It's that when we're talking about raising taxes on the rich, which is exactly what I think you and Shabazz align on 100%, is that rather than nitpicking on the margins, let's really get into the the places where, where that reform needs to happen. Uh, so let me bring Samia and, and Tobias and Sajid into the conversation. I'll bring this question back to you, the debate between expenditure versus revenue. Uh, Samia, a lot of what we're talking about seems to be just a numbers game, right? Shabazz is throwing out a bunch of these numbers. The numbers are quite shocking, so we need to work on the numbers. But there is a there's a foundational human element to these numbers. I, I wonder if, Samia, you could just break down some of what that might mean, uh, especially in terms of, you know, the key lenses or filters that, that you look at in terms of gender and women and children, in terms of public health and nutrition and population. How does this conversation end up affecting uh, the, 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 the contest or the challenge of human development in Pakistan? You'll just need to unmute before you speak, Samia. Thanks. Thanks, Musharraf. Um, yeah, so very interesting question, right? When we look at um, all of the kind of fiscal reforms for sustainability that we need to be taking, uh, we also need to understand how does this impact on the households that are already being so badly affected? And some of the stuff that is out there in terms of um, the data that we have, we realize that 
in the last year, um, where before, where earlier we used to talk about, you know, households facing catastrophic expenditures in terms of uh, sort of, you know, the breadwinner falling ill and and having to pay uh, extensive costs for healthcare um, and also not being able to earn, or where we have sort of um, floods and other kinds of natural disasters which impact on households' uh, ability to to earn or to to uh, sort of, you know, keep their assets intact. Uh, we now are facing a very different scenario where, for example, if you have food inflation rising from 13% to 40% in rural areas within the past 12 months, that becomes a catastrophic expenditure. So food is becoming unaffordable. Uh, the same when we talk about energy inflation, right? 25% to 40% in the last year. Um, most households in urban areas, you know, we're talking about um, yeah, sort of minimum uh, uh, bills of 25,000 rupees. How are people going to be affording their very basics in terms of um, um, food, uh, housing, expenditure, uh, expenditure on education, expenditure on healthcare? Uh, they can't afford it anymore. So we're facing a, a growing population that is being hugely impacted by the current fiscal scenario, uh, the more we squeeze in terms of, uh, you know, increasing taxation, especially on um, uh, the salary classes, uh, and in fact, even on the poorest classes, because even though we can say that the poorest households don't pay tax, they do actually pay tax in terms of the number of um, uh, indirect taxes that they are paying every single day. Uh, on any kind of commodity that they have to buy, on on uh, um, sort of gas, electricity, um, mobility, sort of getting to work and back. So um, I think we really need to understand how do poor house households, um, how can they react to this new scenario? What is it that the government needs to do? How many households are now falling below the poverty line? And if government is looking at expanding its tax base and really trying to uh, bring in that 2% increase, uh, you know, 2% of GDP or 1% of GDP from um, looking at agriculture, looking at land, real estate, uh, how does that, how is that money then also going to be spent? Uh, and I think we really need to understand what then happens to, to public sector development spending, what happens in terms of social protection programs like, like BISC, where you've got currently 9 million households on the registry. Uh, is there a need to expand those households? Or do we need to move on to like 15 million households? Uh, Pakistan's uh, poverty line is, uh, I think it's around 6,600 rupees per person per month is your minimum sort of expenditure, uh, uh, which which aligns you to the poverty line. And if we take a household of six uh, members, uh, your average uh, household size, you, you know, you can kind of uh, calculate that 40,000 rupees is the minimum subsistence level uh, uh, at which people um, can just uh, exist. Um, this data is sort of um, very different to what, what you look at when you look at the global poverty line, right? So when we talk about dollars, so what is the kind of, uh, how many dollars a day uh, is considered the poverty line? Uh, globally, it's $3.65 um, per person uh, per day. Uh, if you look at that in rupee terms, uh, you know, that's um, for a household of six on average in a month, that's coming close to two 200,000 rupees. Uh, and that global poverty line and your, your Pakistan poverty line are not meshing. And so actually, we really need to understand who are now in that bracket of poverty that really needs support um, and what kind of programs. Um, and, and these are not going to be short term programs, right? For the next two to five years, what kind of programs does government really need to look at in terms of ensuring that we don't have a complete breakdown um, uh, across uh, the country in terms of people's ability to afford uh, even food. Um, yeah, so I'll I stop there, Mushara. Yeah. yeah, no, no, thank you, Samia. I, I mean, I think that's a really good, uh, I think what you've done there is a, is a really interesting judo move because I think you flipped the conversation from being about where the money, you know, is being collected from, who it's being collected from, which I think is an important conversation and really, you know, a key to the conversation to the question of, well, whoever the money's being taken from, 
here's a cohort of Pakistanis that need money being given to them. So there's also a fiscal equation there. Uh, you mentioned social protection, and I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, I think we actually might disagree on some aspects of it, because as you know, I'm I'm for a universal basic income. I know that you know you and I have differences on that. But the point is that we need to expand the the sort of expanse of public expenditure on the poor uh, at a time when the rich essentially are saying men any kelna or continuing to say men any kelna uh, which you know uh, of course translated means you know we don't want to play we're not going to pay into the system dr sajid amin um i hope we've given you enough uh, to react and respond to but i mean tell us a little bit about uh, maybe the work that you're doing and your own perspectives and what you've learned about uh, the fiscal reality in this country and whether it's sustainable or not because it's quite clear from what speakers have said so far that not only is it not sustainable but we need to th be thinking about expanding the footprint of social protection now those things are going to require even more money coming into the system so are we going to tax the same people that we need to be paying uh through BISP or through SAS or is there a different way of thinking about where the money's going to come from uh, Dr Sajid I mean you'll just unmute yourself before speaking thanks Thank you, uh, Musharraf. Thank you for having me. I mean, the speakers have given so much uh, that it's really uh, the plate full. Uh, so, mul so much multi-dimensionality from the tax numbers uh, to the expenditure side and then the poverty and inequality angle. Uh, so let me uh, briefly start with the work that we are doing and that you, you have been referring to. I mean, there are two types of work that are really close to the today's discussion. Uh, the one is that uh, and, and this goes to comments of Sobia, actually, uh, that uh, the current systems that are in place in Pakistan, for example, let's say the tax system. Pakistan's tax system is designed for revenue extraction. It's not designed for revenue mobilization or revenue generation. So whenever a system is designed for revenue extraction, because any country which is having so many multiple crises, 23rd IMF program, and the biggest number are the condition is the revenue maximization. So this has become an actually, unfortunately, an indicator of economic success that who raises how much the revenues. And that's a false indicator, but unfortunately, whole the tax system is geared towards uh, this meeting this very myopic or very shallow target of maximizing the revenues without considering the costs, without considering where it is from, indirect taxes. So any system, and this, is, this goes to your question also, how is the sustainability and sustainability? This system is unsustainable. I mean, you, you can make some reforms, but the fundamentals which are guiding these systems are itself so unsustainable that they need a very fundamental shift. So this, this taxation system that we have cannot have, it cannot tax those who are in the tax net, those who are not in the tax net, because this is designed for withholding taxes to meet the revenue targets. It doesn't have efficiency to track, trace, and implement a taxation system, uh, which is for revenue generation or revenue mobilization. So that is one fundamental problem, I think, with the taxi. And this is where we, our work, one of our strand of work is linked. Uh, that this, and, and, and you know, the one important point is that your taxation system is as good as your economic governance system in general is. You cannot expect a good taxation system without a good economic governance model or the economic governance framework. We don't have any efficient economic governance framework. So we will have this kind of taxation, which was an ad hoc base, very short-sighted targets, and then urgency-based tools like rev withholding taxes, indirect taxes. So they are built in the system, actually. So this is where we, we are bringing one of the discussion uh, is that what should be the guiding principle of economic policy, not only the tax policy, the broader tax policy. And that goes to, again, the questions of poverty and inequality. We are saying that there needs a fundamental transformation where economic governance or macroeconomic policies, not only taxes, subsidies, monetary, and other policies should be guided by 
their social footprint is tax collection creating inequality is tax collection while we are meeting targets but it is creating poverty is it increasing unemployment if it is this is a bad taxation system no matter even if collects more than the tax targets actually so that is the uh, the, the key, key summary and so we are calling it uh, macroeconomic policies for economic justice that the overall framework need an overhaul and for this these as as hobia said uh, that these reforms some correcting leakages won't work actually we need a fundamental change and maybe in the second round if if you have time i'll, I'll see we need a three layer a uh, restructuring of the overall economic governance system within which uh, the tax system operates actually number so, one so i think doc sub hold on to that because i do want you to come back on that but i i think tobias has been quite patient and i have to say uh, i think uh it's it's very unlike uh somebody that belongs to the global bureaucracy uh to be willing to engage uh you know in in the in the aftermath of you know what what seemed to be quite a controversial and problematic uh sort of uh, you know and publicly aired uh, exchange i don't think it it benefits us to focus on that i mean i think there's been a story about that there's also been a world bank uh, you know uh, i don't know whether to call it a retraction or a corrective on that but i think tobias what i'm really interested in is and the reason i came to you last is really because i wanted you to have a chance to hear all these viewpoints and I, honestly i mean I already knew how smart uh, Sobia and Shabazz and Sajid and Samia are but it's just accidental that their names start with S but we got to do something about that next time but uh but uh, here's for the QRS and the T uh, Tobias uh, tell us uh, or maybe react to what you've heard so far I mean it sounds to me like um maybe sometimes uh, not just the international bureaucracy but even uh, even people like myself perhaps even people like dr sajid amin or like sobia that maybe we get distracted by sort of smaller issues where maybe the more fundamental issue is the overarching architecture and the political economy around fiscal issues in pakistan uh, to the extent that you can as openly as you can what is your take i mean yeah we've had this story with the with the 50000 rupees and you know there's been a retraction but really this i think in keeping with what sobia said it to me that seems like a very very convenient distraction uh, again for the pakistani elite to kind of continue talking about stuff that doesn't matter whereas uh, some of the things that do matter that sobia's talked about sadish has talked about shabaz has talked about samia has talked about they keep getting kind of pushed to the to the side is that broadly your experience you'll have to unmute before you start speaking and you should start speaking soon thank you mr now i appreciate that look um you know what what is striking i think about this conversation is is uh firstly the high quality of the analysis that's being shared but also how well aligned it is with what the world bank has been saying and what the world bank's views are i mean i i i think that um as you say i mean i don't think we should get distracted by this uh one line that was part of uh one recommendation of a report that included 50 recommendations so as so i'm not going to get into detail on that but but let me maybe just make kind of four points that i think follow up and and add a little bit hopefully to the discussion that that we've already been having I mean I think this question about who pays I mean I I think that um you know Shabazz's point that the salary class the ones who are in the personal income tax net you know they're constantly uh the ones that are facing these increasing in rates and 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 that's 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 true to some extent but I think uh you know Sobia's point is is spot on as well um and what I think we sometimes miss here is that who is really paying for the deficit at the moment it's all pakistanis because it's manifesting as inflation the government is borrowing from the banks and then the central bank is lending to the commercial banks that is increasing the amount of money in the system and that is pushing up prices so the government is financing its fiscal deficit at the cost of inflation and that is a very regressive way to pay for your fiscal deficit so i think we always have to come back to this um this is not a a scenario of don't tax or tax more it's it it's a choice between making everybody pay through inflation or using your tax system to have a more positive distributional approach 
to financing uh, government uh, service delivery and, and, and closing the deficit. So inflation is a big kind of regressive factor here. The GST is a big regressive, uh, well, it's, it's neutral, but it's certainly not progressive. And I think it's very important to emphasize that, you know, personal income tax is about 0.3% of GDP. The, the sales tax is between 3 and 4% of GDP. So, so it, it, it's by far the, the most dominant tax source. And that is a that is a tax that is is faced by all consumers by definition. Uh, and then finally, okay, we have. Is, is it okay if if you'd allow me to just maybe uh, push a little bit on this one? You, sure. you you said that it's not it's neutral the sales tax, whereas to my eyes, the sales tax, even the genesis of the sales tax, because I I was here, uh, you know, it was about twenty years ago when this debate shook the disease with the finance minister. And it started with, you know, I wrote a piece for Herald back in, I think, 2002 or three, where they taxed medicines at 15%. Uh, there was a GST on medicines. And and not me, but like basically an entire generation of people sort of rose up in, in kind of confusion and anger. And so they withdrew that. But but I think that was a great little move because it distracted from, from the wider, I think, regressive establishment of a sales tax regime in this country. I think when you have a sales tax, invariably, the poor are also paying it. So to me, just by nature yeah. of Pakistan's demography, it's regressive. Uh, I'm just pushing back because you you said it was regressive, then you said it was neutral. Is that is it a bank policy issue or is there something technical that I'm missing there? Look, I mean, I, I think I think from a technical perspective, you would say that um, uh, the, the, the direct taxes tend to be more regressive. The reason you prefer a personal income tax is, is that um, it allows you to put progressive, progressivity into the system. And that's why we tend to prefer a, a personal income tax. So I, I have I have no issue with the point you're raising. Uh, a, a, a more progressive income uh, tax system would 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 involve a, a stronger emphasis on direct taxes uh, and, and reduce reliance on, on the indirect tax. I mean, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is 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 and, and the final point I wanted to make here as well was I mean the withholding tax system as well is is equally uh, regressive and contributes to the regressivity of the overall tax system. Because essentially, what you have is is withholding on on uh, service transactions, uh, and and what that means is that even people who are not subject to a personal income tax are facing withholding, and that that withholding is on everyday essentials such as electricity or telecommunications. So, so my overall point is fundamentally in agreement with your point, uh, Mushraf. We, we have a, a system that is much more regressive than it should be. Um, and and, and I, I just wanted to bring in that aspect of inflation and the heavy reliance on the, on the GST. Um, you know, I, I think the the question of what, why we have this and why do we constantly go for these moves to, for example, increase the GST rate or, or, or increase the tax rates on, on particular uh, in the segments of the population within the tax net. It's because the, uh, just as, uh, as again, Sobia was saying, the, the, the fundamental tax levers are, are not functioning the way they should be functioning. We, we don't have enough people within the personal income tax uh, net to, to use that effectively as a, as a redistributive tool. And that's partly just because incomes overall are, are low in a, in a poor country. Um, we, are, we are not, we're explicitly not suggesting to reduce the, 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 uh, the bottom threshold for income taxes. We're simply making the point right now that, that you, you, you frankly have a large proportion of the population that is falling below the personal income tax thresholds. They're not part of that system. And then you have a lot of very high income individuals that are not subject to that system because they find particular ways of evading taxes or avoiding taxes due to the complexity of the tax system. So, so what should we do about this? And, and again, you know, I, I really want to emphasize that the, the World Bank report had something like 50 recommendations. Um, and, and really what we wanted the emphasis to be, and, and maybe we didn't communicate this as, as clearly as we needed to, what we wanted the emphasis to be on is, is really four priorities. Firstly, closing the exemptions. There needs to be a review of these exemptions, which are costing up to 30% of total tax revenue. 
And many of those are, are, are frankly driven by political considerations. Many of them are regressive. There needs to be a, a review of those exemptions to make sure that they make sense. Uh, and I think there's substantial revenue that could be raised from closing those exemptions. The, the second point is the, the goods and services tax. Uh, you know, that needs fundamental reform. It need, the administration of it needs to be improved. It needs to be made so that it's easier for people to comply. Uh, and that way we would bring more businesses into the tax net. Uh, and, and that would see the burden more broadly shared. Thirdly, I think we need to improve the taxation of agriculture. That doesn't necessarily mean going after small, small farmers. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that the tax rates on agricultural land are extremely low. Many large landholders are not paying uh, very much tax at all on agricultural income, and, and that needs to be reformed. And, and finally, property tax. I think everybody knows that a, a very important store of wealth and investment opportunity for the wealthy in this country is in real estate and property. Uh, and and the, 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 the property tax regime is, is, frankly, it's out of line with international practice. Uh, in terms of the amount of revenue that's being generated from that. Now, let me give you just one, one, one soundbite on that. The um, urban removal, removal property tax, I mean, we use Punjab as an example, but any province could be used. Currently, the rate is about 0.07% compared to a low-income country rate norm of about 0.5%. So right there, we're collecting about a tenth. Uh, of the amount of revenue we could be uh, for, for, from lands taxation. Um, I think, you know, ultimately, when, when, you're, when you're moving through taxes, when you're increasing taxes, when you are closing exemptions, there are going to be some impacts on the poor. And, and that's why we have to see the tax system, and this is my final point, that's why we have to see the tax system and the expenditure side as part of the same system. Right. So uh, typically, you know, the emphasis on, on your tax system is to raise revenues and you compensate the poor through the expenditure side. Now, we're not saying we should be pursuing regressive taxation. We're saying we should be pursuing progressive taxation. But nonetheless, there is going to be a need to protect the poor. And we think that that, that is why uh, there should be a heavy emphasis on expanding uh, the, the Benazir Income Support Program. Uh, potentially increasing the coverage through that program. We've got coverage of 9 million of, of, of roughly 40 million households. Maybe that does need to be expanded. Um, and also reform to the withholding regime would actually provide a lot of relief to, to low income households. These are people that are being taxed when formally they should not be in the personal income tax net. So, so I think if we look at these big picture reforms on the revenue side, we combine them with some of the compensatory measures you can make on the expenditure side. There's a lot of potential to close this fiscal deficit in a progressive way, but what it requires is some fundamental change. It requires using some different policy levers, and it means we have to move beyond just the, the easy fixes of going after the you know, the salaried classes or increasing the GST rates, which is typically what's been relied on in the past. I think that's a great uh, sort of summary of, of what you just said. Shabazz, if you heard Tobias, which I know you did carefully, uh, you'll find that he basically is echoing a lot of what, what you opened the conversation with in terms of where the focus needs to be. So rather than further debating what needs to happen, because I think there's broad consensus in the group uh, that there is a fiscal crisis, that the crisis needs to be addressed at least partially, if not overwhelmingly, and Sobia, I'll come to this question on the expenditure side, but I just quickly want to bring in Shabazz to ask him this question. Shabazz, you've been reporting on these things for the better part of a decade and a half. Uh, I mean, I, I remember you as a cub reporter, uh, and now you're, you're one of the sort of elder statesmen in, in the field. In this last decade and a half, has the conversation been very different from the first day you reported to today in terms of what was needed? And if it hasn't been, has the crisis of the last year, year and a half suggested to you that there are decision makers in Pakistan that are now finally seeing the light and are likely to move in the direction that Sajid, Tobias, Sobia and Samia seem to be saying Pakistan needs to move towards? Are you seeing a change in the overarching political will in this country, given that you directly engage with a lot of, in fact, every single important economic policymaker 
you've engaged with one-on-one -on -one and in group settings over the last 15 years. So what's the what's changing? Mushraf, thank you very much for this last question. After that, I'll beg your leave because I have to rush for another meeting. Uh, unfortunately, not. The topics remain the same. Uh, I mean, if I'm not in this profession uh, tomorrow, someone else will come and he will be reporting the same topics that I have started reporting back in 2006 and 2007. Uh, so that is the unfortunate part. The good thing is that somehow there is some realization, but not at the highest level. Uh, I, ex I often quote one example that in one week I went to meet people who matter in this country, not in Islamabad. Then I went to Prime Minister House, uh, Ministry of Finance, I call it my second home. I went there, met with people. Uh, frankly, the kind of in, the kind of crisis that we have right now, there was not realization at all three places that I'm mentioning. And these places are very, very important. They have direct role in making or destroying the destiny of Pakistan. So that might be a blunt comment. But uh, just to conclude uh, my um, point, I would 100% agree with what Tobias said at the end, that we need reforms. And that is the moment we should catch. Uh, the World Bank is supporting the with the holding tax reforms. He has rightly said it is a regressive measure. It should it should be done away with. Uh, instead of doing it gradually, it should be done radically. I mean, uh, the sheet that I have, eighty percent of the with the holding taxes collection is just under the ten heads, and we have we have more than twenty five uh, with holding taxes. And if you break up it into subsections, there are maybe close to three dozen kind of withholding taxes. But on the point of uh, focusing on just BISP. Uh, by just focusing on the BISP, uh, we take away uh, the shift from the sufferings of the lower middle income groups of, of Pakistan. One, uh, Pakistan doesn't have en enough resources to even uh, provide subsidies or cash stipends to all the people who have been surveyed and they are eligible uh, for the BISP grant, but, but we don't have money. We can't even uh, fund those people who are in the BISP survey or to talk about the lower middle income group. And I'm not advocating any kind of subsidies for them. What I'm saying, when we say that, okay, we are taking these kind of reforms, which will carry implications for the people, uh, and let's focus on BISP. When we say let's focus on the BISP, that is just half of the story. The complete story is the sufferings of the lower middle income group and the middle income group are left uh, unaddressed. Thank you. Thanks, Shabazz, and thanks for joining us. I think, uh, you know, you said what you said was blunt. I think blunt is at least the minimum that we expect from each other in a, in a, in a state of both global regional and domestic uh, crisis and not not a light crisis. This is a multi-layered, multi-sectoral crisis that doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. And if we can't speak bluntly now, then when will we ever? So I appreciate your reporting and also, you know, everything that you said here. Uh, Sobia, quickly, um, and Shabazz, we'll let you go whenever whenever you need to. Thanks once again for Thank joining. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave you. I'll leave now. Thank Fantastic. You. Take care. Thank you, Shabazz. Sobia, this... this this conversation uh, or this question about uh, the, you know, the expenditure side, that can you have a full conversation about the expenditure side? I've already shared my, my hang up, right? Uh, it seems to me, as soon as we start talking about taxes, when we have an honest conversation, we end up talking about taxing the rich. And as soon as we start talking about taxing the rich, somebody just puts up their hand and says, but uh, sir, sir, what about expenditure what about cutting expenditure there's two or three sort of there's a big um, there are these big uh, kind of uh, you might say um like uh swifties or then taylor swift ke. so so you see that there's these groups that really love different categories of ex expenditure uh my favorite is the group that says we need to cut defense expenditure while the rest of the world you know sort of slides into all kinds of conflict and we've seen what happened in the middle east over the weekend, we've seen what happened in Russia, Ukraine. We watch what happened between Azerbaijan and Armenia. We're watching what's happening between Serbia and Kosovo. And we've seen what India has done vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan since 2019 in particular. At that time, we want to cut defense expenditure. Now, this isn't an apologia for, for military expenditure. It's just the reality of what Pakistan is. Other folks want to cut expenditure in terms of we have too many public sector employees or we have too many pensioners. Again, in a country with massive, you know, fiscal crises and with an inflationary bomb, uh, I'm not sure that, you know, less teachers and less doctors is the answer to the pain and the suffering of the Pakistani people. Um, and then, of course, the, the biggest and the easiest is let's cut PSDP. Let's cut unnecessary road building and, and building building and bridge building uh, and highway building. 
Uh, meanwhile, the only source of growth in, in a lot of economies ends up being core infrastructure. So how do you grow if you don't develop infrastructure? This is my complaint. Maybe you have a counterfactual to this in terms of what we need to look at on expenditure. I mean, some of them are easy, right? State-owned ex enterprises, uh, inefficient expenditures of that nature. Uh, those are the easy ones. But am I missing something here in this equation? Is there more we can do on the expenditure side? Sobia? Yeah. See, when I talk about expenditures, I mean, say, for example, you've collected 100 rupees in all the taxes, right? And then we are not careful and 70, you know, 70 rupees out of that goes to your debt servicing and then you're left with 30%. And I think the citizens are now getting more aware of what I'm going to say, that if you're not careful, if you're not frugal, if you do not have austerity measures of where those 30 rupees are going, it's not going to help. We're just saying, let's you know, you know, raise more taxes and then let's not be careful where they are going. You're absolutely right. We don't have to, you know, I'm not I'm not going to say, all right, we should, you know, stop all the PSDP, you know, funding, but we can review those projects which are not doing very well. Um, pension reforms are needed. Hiring freezes might be one of the options. But if, you know, but we don't have to pursue them at the moment if, if they seem politically unfeasible at this point in time due to the inflation and other things going on. Um, you know, uh, you've just mentioned state-owned enterprises. We can think about the ones which we want to retain, the ones which we want to privatize. There are the, you know, certain ones which are not doing well at all. Um, you know, what about austerity measures? When we, you know, hear news, you know, paper reports where 70 more, you know, you know, um, cars have been bought uh, by a certain, you know, uh, department, it, it it doesn't help the government, right? Um, we have recently increased the travel allowances and everything. Why? I mean, is that something which we can afford at the moment? So there are, I mean, there are a lot of ways in which we can cut spending. Some of them might be politically, you know, difficult at this point in time. Let's focus on others. And I would just, you know, um, you know, focus on one of the earlier points. I think our ta tax system is rigged by the elite. You know, it, it, it is made to serve the tax, the large tax pairs the it the politicians the tax collectors and it is not supporting the smaller taxpayers and we need a paradigm shift i think as i just said we need to improve the system that it starts serving the smaller taxpayer and that is you know we have like um tobias was just telling us we we, we have 80 recommendations how why can't we have this inequality lens all right which are the you know certain sets of reforms which we can focus on at the moment that, that they would not hurt the poor at this point in time because we don't want to do that. But then there are other feasible options. And the last point which I would like to make, you know, I keep saying that uh, if we keep focusing on small, short-term, you know, the practical, practic feasible reforms at the moment, we are missing out on, you know, um, focusing on the larger problems. And those larger problems don't remain the same. They get worse. So we have to, I mean, you just hinted onto that. I think it is the time now to actually make these difficult decisions. We do not have a lot of time left where we are not taking these, you know, you know, difficult decisions. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think this, uh, this question of difficult decisions is one that in a sense, I think, you know, I asked Shabazz as well. And what he said at the end is really, uh, I mean, I, I'm a little bit older than him and, it's the same. It's the same story. Uh, Tobias knows. Uh, I was working on uh, World Bank funded tax administration reform projects twenty years ago, and it's literally the same project memoranda that sort of get passed down from one generation to like through three generations of civil servants and and World Bank, uh, you know, economists and staffers. And I think it's easy to lash out at, at the World Bank or lash out at the bureaucracy. But I think for a lot of people that are watching this conversation, uh, they don't have many places to lash out at. And so I think, you know, I think a lot of us, frankly, are more answerable than 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 we tend to be. And, and I think having this kind of a conversation, I think, is an important part of that. Samya, this this question of what um, I think what Sobia alluded to and, and kind of what Shabazz alluded to more explicitly, that in the in the extreme binary versions of the conversation, do we risk missing out on the very real issue of a middle class crisis? Uh, sure, we can address some of the gap by expanding 
the net of uh, Benazir Income Support Program or what used to be called SAS. And I, by the way, deliberately include SAS with Benazir Income Support Program because I think this nomenclature a fight is a useless one. And I think that both, uh, you know, partisans of one side and partisans of another need to realize how valuable this is as a national asset. So I'll call it whatever anybody needs to call it, but we need to increase the size. But I think the point, uh, to the point that Shabazz made, maybe you can expand on this, uh, maybe through some uh, uh, some other data. I mean, you mentioned the poverty line. Uh, and if I re recall correctly, the minimum wage is way lower than even the poverty line uh, currently. So there, all these complexities, uh, Samia, are we risking missing out on uh, a growing resentment and dissatisfaction within the within the middle class, especially in urban areas in Pakistan? Um, yeah, a short answer to your question, Musharraf, is yes. Um, you can tell, you can sense that people are getting more and more frustrated because what people are not seeing is any deliberate actions to actually make those tough decisions, but make tough decisions with empathy, understand who's going to be affected, be transparent in how those decisions are being made and tell the people what sort of, um, uh, where they are going to have to uh, so make sacrifices. I think we talk a lot about, we use the word we when we are talking about making these big decisions or, or taking forward policy recommendations. Who is this we? What, are, what kind of independent autonomous institutions do we have who could really bring about these major decisions in terms of taxation reform? Um, our parliament, our Senate, is filled of, with people who are benefiting from the current um, sort of elite capture of the system. So who are we looking to uh, in order to actually provide reforms that address uh, some of the very grave concerns of our uh, uh, lower and middle classes um, and provide some kind of... Uh, longer term solution where people can understand that, okay, for the next couple of years, we do need to tighten our belts. We do need to make sacrifices. We are going to be pressured, but then there is light at the end of the tunnel. And so far, I, I don't think, I mean, we've had discussions, uh, you know, within the bad lab, um, that hope is not there. Um, and, and that hope needs to be uh, instituted through um, a very transparent mechanism of of developing the kind of reforms and uh, ensuring that they are uh, implemented since you mentioned uh you know uh, our our team and and our people just to give uh, you know viewers and listeners a taste of the kinds of you know i guess policy decisions that even a small firm has to make um a few months ago we switched to four days a week with one day work from home uh, not as a lifestyle issue, but purely as a as a cost uh, and inflation uh, counterinflation measure. Uh, the cost of getting to work for a lot of colleagues uh, of ours uh, has become so prohibitive that it's eating up up to, in some cases, 40, 50 percent of people's wages, uh, which is an insane level of, uh, you know, penalty. And this penalty, I believe, is being paid by Pakistani middle classes. These are not lower middle class. I mean, these are people that have very high quality educations, you know, that come from families that can, that, that, if, that were able to afford good universities for them. And those folks are paying 30, 40, 50% of their monthly wages in, in very good jobs uh, to transportation costs. So one can only imagine the impact this is having at the layers below that. Uh, Tobias, I want to come to you and, and uh, Sajid, uh, Doc Sajid, I'll, I'll end with you. I, I'd like you to kind of wrap this up and sum up, you know, the overarching fiscal sort of regime in this country. But Tobias, when you hear uh, of these sorts of challenges, uh, I mean, uh, the, the thing that I neglected to mention is we're thinking of now seriously considering going to three days a week and making two days work from home because uh, every every few weeks there's a new inflationary sort of spike and it's getting more and more difficult to uh, be able to expect people to show up to work every day given the cost of getting to work is this something that uh, the world bank here in washington dc is 
actively conscious of or is this something that you know pops up on the radar once in a while i'm asking not as a critical point i'm asking because i think so much of what you know comes from the bank in terms of advice has much more weight than what ordinary pakistanis uh would ask of their government because of the nature of elite capture because of the nature of public policy uh so i just wanted maybe for you to reflect on you know your uh your take on how you're able to absorb or or uptake uh, information and signals and 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 symbols from from the pakistani sort of market no thanks so much look i mean we had a conference uh that, that 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 you were participating in a couple of weeks ago here and and the way we framed that conference was that this is a moment of crisis for pakistan uh, and that policies have been captured by by elites, and that it is leading us towards a a, a full macroeconomic crisis. I, I don't think the World Bank can be more clear on this. Uh, the poverty numbers using the lower middle income uh, country poverty threshold, we have a five percentage point increase in poverty in the past year. Uh, we've we've been saying this out loud. Um, the model is not working. The model is not working. And, and I think that uh, what we can say and what I want to add to this conversation as well is that to some extent, we need a short term period of, I, I, I have to say, austerity. I'm not sure what else to say. We have to, we have to bring down the fiscal deficit sharply now to get us out of these these real problems of, of macroeconomic stability, right? So we, we have to bring down the deficit sharply now so that the debt path can 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 move towards a, a downward trajectory. And that's a very technical point to make. But but the point I'm making that is that through some short term measures on the fiscal side, we can put the economy back on a sustainable footing. Once the economy is back on the sustainable footing, we need to move beyond this, this language of cutting expenditure and, and, and who pays more tax. And we need to be talking about growth. We need to be talking about increasing incomes. We need to be talking about improving productivity. That ultimately is going to be what puts money in people's pockets so that they can afford their imported consumption goods, so that they can afford their electricity, so that they can afford their fuel. Um, and so, uh, you know, the fiscal is super important because it is a short term emergency and there needs to be increased revenues and there needs to be, I think, at least in the short term, some consolidation on expenditure. We need to do that in a progressive way. But that's that's not the future of the country. The future of the country comes then from moving towards higher rates of economic growth so that people have money in their pockets so the pie keeps growing. Now, that that is a, a an economic argument uh, for, for what the priority should be and what the policy reform should be. But it's also a political economy argument as well. Because if you can say some difficult reforms in the short term will actually start to grow the the pie in the long term, you move away from this idea of this being a, a zero sum game where we're fighting over who has to bear the cost towards a trajectory where everyone can be better off, right? And I, I think that ultimately is, is how other countries have managed this kind of crisis. It's, it's, it's clearly deciding collectively uh, and communicating that th there is a plan, there is a path, there is some short-term pain to be borne. We need to bear that in the most progressive way possible, protecting the poor. But ultimately what this is for is to get the economy back to a path where, where the economy is growing, jobs are, are available, incomes are improving, uh, and, and, and everybody wins in that situation. And everybody should have a shared stake in moving towards that situation if we can get beyond the, the short-term uh, fights over short-term interests. So let me just stop with that. Important point, you made it. I'm almost certain that Sajid uh, Amin would have would have brought up this this question of growth and the wider sort of fiscal paradigm. And and but it's a it's a brilliantly made point. I guess, uh, Sajid, uh, just to bring the conversation to you and to ask you to summarize it, but maybe let me add a little bit of a provocation uh, to whatever you're going to summarize. Every time we've used starvation diets, which is what I think of 
austerity in this country. It's a starvation diet. And it's not really starvation of the rich. It's a starvation of the poor. I mean, if you cut PSDP, the construction workers that you're going to hire are not going to get jobs. The contractor, even if he's a low quality contractor and there's a little bit of, you know, rent seeking involved at the lowest level, but that contractor won't be able to buy supplies. So the downstream impact of cutting PSDP spending is profound in terms of growth. But even if you even if we accept that as a legitimate way of doing things, the experience of Pakistan, Dr. Sajid Amin, to my memory, and you are the expert, so you tell me if I'm wrong or right, is that every time we've used the starvation diet to get the fiscal deficit, not back in order, but t trending towards order, as soon as the spigots have opened, we've fueled the growth with unsustainable measures, with real estate driven growth and consumption led growth and dollar denominated growth. And all of those kinds of growths have a expiry date and an upper limit. And those upper limits are being reached faster and faster. So each one of our growth and bust cycles is now shorter and shorter. So yes, we need to grow, but if the way to growth and the kind of growth that, to, you know, that I've laid out is what's in the future, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a desirable way forward, um, especially if it includes not taxing the rich, because the starvation diet is for the poor and the middle class. It's not for the rich. Dr. Sajid Amin. Thank you, uh, Musharraf. I mean, really, the discussion is so rich, uh, and, and our ex experts have so much great insights that I really don't find myself not in a capacity to summarize it sort of. Uh, but let me give a couple of reactions or a couple of my points. Uh, but just two quick points on your, uh, I mean, we don't have any middle income now. I mean, the middle class, actually. I mean, we, we, we just give it uh, the word that we have a middle class, uh, the kind of 35% inflation, loss of jobs, livelihoods. We're left with no middle income now, honestly. Uh, the middle income is just now on the poverty line or below the poverty line, we, we can find it. It doesn't have. My second point of caution before before I come to your uh, summary, uh, I mean, the final question on this one. I think we have to be very mindful that when we, we, we are giving uh, a residual compensation to a very regressive taxation system, I mean, asking that it is a regressive taxation system and it can continue, but we need to sort of compensate it with BISP. I think let's let's just compare that how much GST collects from the bottom 40% and how much BISP gives to those bottom 40%. It's you 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 will have a net negative or not net burden on the poor actually. So I think within the taxation system. Because, you know, the social protection need to expand definitely uh, in terms of both linking it to inflation, broadening, as, as Tobias said, that increasing more households. But this should not be an alternate or compensation to a regressive taxation system. Because, uh, as I told, the, what extracts this G GST or other regressive taxation are extracting is much, much more higher than what is this subsidies are giving to the bottom pool. 40%, many minimum subsidies go to uh, the bottom 40%, uh, even if they are designed for them. And, and you know it, for example, even the fertilizer subsidies. I'm a small farmer, I bought only two bags. A larger farmer buys 100 bags. Uh, the subsidy goes to the larger farmer again, not to me as a small farmer. So I think we need to read uh, this taxation system. And this is where I go to my final uh, point on, on this one. But one point on your austerity, this is a very important point, actually, and I was taking this note, actually. Austerity may give us a stabilization for some time. It doesn't lead to sustainability. Uh, and our shorter period that Tobias was referring to has been the seven decades <laughs> that we have been sort of experiencing this short-term austerity. Uh, it hasn't given us a solution. So, in, and, and, and I think we need to work on three layers simultaneously and if i can focus it on the fiscal system or the taxation system more specifically the one is exactly the kind of recommendations which are coming we need to tax the rich we need to bring in uh, tax on the income irrespective it is coming from agriculture i, I don't think why is this debate actually let's just tax incomes no matter where it is coming if there is a certain limit on the income tax and then you you tax it beyond it it's coming from property, it is coming from agriculture. 
so that that will solve your these question that who to tax actually so um, i think we should uh, do this one we need to uh, sort of avoid this tax evasion and some other things but i think this is ad hoc solution within this broader system in which we are for example sobia's point and samia's point on expenditure side our expenditure is not a revenue problem uh, let's be uh, i mean my my point is this one it is our financial system national finance commission problem actually the nfc that you have does not give any incentive to provinces to collect taxes and they, they they have no incentive to invest in infrastructure tax infrastructure because it has only 7% weightage so that is the second layer where we need to work on very structural foundations what sobia and saima and tobias has been referring to where is this problem coming from and the day when the finance minister is making a speech you are negative in the account on the book to finance any development expenditures psdp fully the day speech is being made your debt defense and day to day expenditure take all your revenues because your national finance commission is designed in a way provinces are net taking from federal instead of contributing to that pool and if your provinces are not helping you collect taxes you cannot adjust revenues by austerity or by other measures so that is the second layer there are more structural issues that we need to work on and third and final is uh, and this again goes to back to the comments from the, the this uh, panelists and speakers coming what should be the guiding principle for a taxation system in we uh, let, let me give you an example uh, you know what is the tax to gdp ratio of bangladesh maybe twice has the exact number i don't have exact number but most probably it is still a percentage point less than pakistan however if you go to the tax to gdp ratio more or less similar are slightly lower than pakistan but what is the difference is that the taxation system for development for social and economic taxation for economic development and social development and taxation for revenue extraction are fundamentally two different things we are on the later actually i think if our taxation system can move towards taxation for development and that is where your last question and i'll stop here then the structure of growth our taxation system is aligned with a consumption based economy and it supports that consumption based economy it does not invest in, in incentivize me to invest i mean if if you get take one example of you know the documentation drive every government does it but it does to extract money from the people to meet the revenue targets and not to facilitate their businesses nobody is buying your tax uh, i mean the formality uh, drives because you you are putting it not for facilitating the businesses you are just trying to extract those numbers you are in the last quarter you have to meet the tax targets and then you go and let me just finally i mean this is sort of what would you think of with that taxation system which takes a pride in collecting inflation tax and celebrates that we have collected more than the targets without considering 35% inflation 70% coming from gst and there is a celebration i think we need to work three things simultaneously and world bank and uh, like you musharraf we have a big sort of very impactful voices uh, the first is that we we need to have a very strong what is the purpose of taxation actually we we need to let the taxation system know that the purpose of taxation system is to uh, promote economic development promote social development not only to meet the targets by regressive uh, measures number 2 i think the structural issues like national finance commission and others needs to be corrected the new government should come and make a national finance commission because it is due and that should have a new formula and we are working on 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 these similar issues something and simultaneously the third layer uh, that that tobias and other colleagues are also referring and i do agree uh, that we cannot wait for a long term solution we need to work on simultaneously and these are not mutually exclusive actually they are simultaneously they can be started so i hope i was able to s- sort of uh, tackle your question but not sure it's so big question uh, it it's very difficult to question 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sajid Amin, uh, Sovia Khurram, Sami Aliaka, Tobias Haq, and of course, Shabazz Rana, who was with us earlier. Uh, no, not only did you answer my questions, uh, Dr. Amin, uh, but really this panel was, uh, I have to say, uh, beyond my expectations, incredibly rich conversation. Um, all of you were, were a revelation. Uh, I, I must especially thank, I think, Tobias, you for kind of willing to be uh, part of the conversation, given the kind of flack that uh, I think, uh, you know, the bank has had to deal with. Uh, Dr. Sajid Amin, I know how busy you are, and, and I think you, you didn't disappoint at all. I, I think such a high quality set of, uh, especially your summary was really beneficial, including things that I disagree with, but, but, uh, but that I think is the beauty of, of a discourse in which we can have these conversations. Sobia, uh, such a pleasure to have you. I think this was your first uh, Tabad Lab Policy Roundtable hopefully not your last, uh, we will come back to you. We really benefited from your participation and Samia, of course, uh, you know, the Bad Lab colleagues get to take you for granted. So thank you once again for, for uh, enriching the conversation today. Uh, of, of obviously my thanks in absentia to Shabazz Rana and, uh, and, and to those that, that watched and that continue to engage, uh, you know, these are very difficult times uh, for the whole world, but especially for Pakistan and especially for those in Pakistan that are not uh, among the privileged few. Um, I'm grateful that we have a chance to keep talking about these issues with some of the best experts in the region, in the country, sometimes in the world. And uh, we'll try to keep bringing you these conversations to the best of our ability and keep trying to influence and affect better decision-making here and, and everywhere else. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you very soon.